tech guy, much smarter than me. I usually just go into his office, sit down, and just start talking because that's the only thing I'm good at. <laughs> so he's going to be so proud of me. I figured this out. I'm going to fire him tomorrow. Yeah, you're done. You just well, saved yourself a lot of money. We're really glad you figured it out. So we get to speak to you now. So thank you. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, thank you. What time is it over there? Uh, 6 a.m. 6 a.m. Oh, good. Are you guys early risers? Yeah, yeah, we're usually up about 4 o'clock most days, so this is a sleep-in, really. <laughs> yeah, I amen, brother. That's me, too. Yeah. How, how about you? What time is it for you? It is 1 o'clock. 1 o'clock. Where are you? So you're on the west afternoon. side. No, I am in side Idaho. Side. Idaho. Yeah, South, beautiful. Southeast Idaho. Okay. Excellent. That's, awesome. that's unreal. I actually just heard, uh, I heard you talk on a few podcasts, and so that's how I kind of came about you. Um and then from there, I was like, "Well, he's giving the same message that we we like to portray. So let's let's get him on if he's if he's willing." So yeah, it kind of worked out really well. So I'm Maddie. Yeah, and this I, is Stacy, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> hi guys. Hi, nice to meet you. Um, and so nice to meet you. I guess to to give you a quick history on us, like we we run a nutrition company, uh, so personalizing meal plans for people, individuals um, throughout the world, which is really cool. It's kind of online, which makes it a lot easier to hit people from around the world. And we've kind of been going for about three years now and started the podcast about two years ago and just have been trying to help through giving people information however we can. A lot of our people actually CrossFitters, so a lot of our listeners are from the CrossFitting realm. So um, I, I... do you have much to do with CrossFitters and dieting or anything like that? You do? Yeah, cool. Uh, I had, yes, sir. I had figured that you would, but a, a lot of the stuff I've heard you talk about is mainly around the, the bodybuilding realm. So, yeah, I just wasn't quite sure. Yeah, you know, I'm so lucky. I get to see athletes of all levels, amateur, professional, in almost all the sports. Probably, believe it or not, the biggest group of people I take care of are MMA fighters. Okay, cool. Um, and then a lot of retired NFL Mm-hmm. players yeah um, and yes of course the meatheads like me the bodybuilders and the mm-hmm. power lifters and but yeah i love crossfitters too yeah they're a special group i gotta they tend to go overboard and so uh-huh. i'm usually uh my entire goal in in my practice is to help people recover yes so you guys knowing the nutrition side know how important that is and that's yeah. really one of the keys yeah. So yeah, that's awesome because that's something Absolutely. that we will would love touch to touch on, on yeah, maybe definitely. in the podcast. Um, so the other side Good. of things, uh, one of the one of the CrossFit athletes actually from Australia, he placed third this year and he uh, got caught having Psalms. Do you know much about the product Psalms? Could, yeah, could we do. touch on that during the show? Is that cool? Sure, absolutely. Unreal. Yep, awesome. selective androgen receptor modulators. You bet. Mm-hmm. Excellent. All right, cool. Is there well, anything that you don't want to talk about before we officially start? Um, I'm in trouble with my wife right now, so I probably shouldn't talk about that. No, I'm just kidding. No, anything's wide open, you guys. Whatever I can do to help your you guys out, and Amazing. I'm wide open. I'm an open book, so ask anything. Unreal. Fantastic. And uh, so Timing. your books. I just want to make sure. Better than steroids and naked. Is there a third one or not? I have seven actually. Oh some gosh. of them are. Some of them are very niche. Okay. Um, my, my, um, I'll show you a picture of my newest one. This is the newest one. Fat to fit to fat. Awesome. And it really talks about, uh, the subtitle is a uh, co- problem with contemporary dieting and exercise recommendations. And this is where I kind of get into the overtraining under eating world, mm-hmm. which everyone seems to be getting into. One of my biggest clientele i guess you could say the biggest patient load i get is people that are exercising that just are not reaching goals yeah and really it, it's a recovery thing again they're over exercising and under eating and cortisol is too high stress levels are too high their hormones are totally messed up they're toxic from all the crap they've been doing yeah it's just it's it's such a bigger picture than just eat less and exercise more mm-hmm. and is that especially what people nowadays? sometimes coin as adrenal fatigue Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Adrenal fatigue actually happens right here. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. It's, it's between the ears. The adrenals don't ever give out. When adrenals give out, it's called Addison's disease and you die. Mm-hmm. Um, but a true adrenal fatigue is the effect of cortisol on the brain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's, it's, real, it's very, very real. And so honestly, I don't care what people call it. Yeah. The solution is still the same. Awesome. Yeah, yeah okay, we'd cool. love to dive into yeah, that. Yeah, touch on that a little okay. bit as well. Right. Timing-wise. Yes, timing. How long do you have? 
as long as you guys need, I don't think I have anything until 2.30, my time. So I have an hour and a half. If you need longer, I can I can send a text while we're talking and make it work. So whatever you guys need. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Well, you're awesome. Yeah, you're amazing. <laughs> Thank you. And just to confirm, it's uh, Dr. Warren Willie. Or is it Wiley? Willie. Willie, it is. Yeah, Willie, cool. you got it right. Yeah. Excellent. Well, we'll get started. Great. Good stuff. All right, guys. Welcome to the Chief Life Podcast. I'm Matthias Turner, joined by a co-host, Stacey Lee Turner. Hey, guys. And today we're lucky enough to be joined via Skype with Dr. Warren Willie. Warren, right, welcome. Hi there. Doctor, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. And so, Thanks for having me. I guess to give you a bit more of a background, uh, you're an osteopathic physician, but can you dive in a little deeper as to what you actually I want to give you a wrap. You're a, a ripped doctor, which is sick to see. It's someone who actually cares <laughs> in their cares about their health, a doctor who really is out there uh, performing and giving practicing what he's preaching. Uh, exactly. Give me a shit about how you feel and how you look, uh, and being able to give that back to your patients, which is absolutely unreal. It's it's a hard thing to come by. So um, it's really cool, first of all. But can you give yourself oh, a bit more of background? Yeah. Sure, you bet. You know what? Um, now, you, you're you going to be sorry you asked that because you might get my life story now, so sit back. Um, no, but seriously, I, w- I grew up a very sickly kid. I grew up uh, with bad asthma. And long story short, I, I figured out at the uh, ripe old age of 11 or 12 how food affected my breathing. Hmm. And that's what got me into the world of nutrition. And I started uh, – Eating right, my dad got me a subscription to um, Muscle and Fitness. Back then, it was called Muscular Development. That just tells you how old I am. Good grief. (laughs) Anyway, um, but I started reading that cover to cover, and that was before it was all ads, right? It was actually real – the ads, believe it or not, this is funny. The only ads were for gym equipment because there was no gyms back in the early 80s, late 70s. So. Anyway, um, started reading that, getting into it, and I got my first job as a personal trainer. Back then, it was even before ACE had a certification, so there was no certifications for us. I was just kind of the kid that cleaned up the gym and showed people how to use the weights, right? Yeah. And and that's all I've done all my entire life is personal training, finally got certified in personal training, then decided to go to medical school and just kept going. So I consider myself a very expensive personal trainer, really. But what what my goal in life is is to teach people that health can be obtained wherever you're at. If you want a certain physique, if you want to be a bodybuilder, you want to be a top-level crossfitter, you want to be an Olympic cross-country skier, you still have to fall. We still fall under the same umbrella of physiology. We still have these basic needs that need to be met. And then we get more specific with you. What's your stressors? What's your relationships like? What's your spiritual life like? I mean, all these things come into play. It's so much bigger than, well, eat this, don't eat that, move Mm. this way, don't move that way. It's a bigger thing. So in practice, I try to apply that. And right now where I've finally built myself up to in my practice, 100% of my practice is just that. I get people coming in from all over the place who primary complaints fatigue, they're worn out, they're a professional athlete, they're a a business exec, they're they're a stay-at-home mom who, bless their hearts, have the hardest job in the world, and they are just tired and whooped, but they're trying, they're exercising hard, they're eating right, they're doing everything they're told to do, yet they're still gaining, or they can't get rid of that belly fat, or it's getting bigger, Mm. and they're just so tired all the time, and now they're moody, so now they're husbands think they're going through menopause and they're only 29. I mean, it goes on and on and on, right? Yeah. And so that's so part of that, and to answer your question earlier, is I try to keep myself in shape. I try to stay very lean. I'm always between somewhere between 6 and 8% body fat. Mm-hmm. Just because I try to, I have to practice what I preach for one. Yeah. But when I slip up, oh, I feel like crap. Mm-hmm. Can I say can I say crap? Yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say another word, but my wife would yell at that. One. So, yes, uh, and so I really I just try to live it. And it's such a bigger picture than, again, not eating when everyone else is eating Christmas treats this time of year. I'm not. It's a lot more than that. It's a bigger picture. Of course I'm eating Christmas treats. But it's a big picture. How do I sleep? How do I handle my stress? How do I exercise but not over-exercise? Something I'm sure we'll probably get into here. And, and and that's what I try to do. So I try to maintain the look. I, I was a bodybuilder just because I was such a skinny, sickly little kid. I thought the only way to get the chicks when I was 18 was to have the body. So I just tried to keep it this whole time. Now, thank goodness my wife likes me no matter what. Um, so, But I still try to maintain it for her. 
Yeah. And I noticed because we've been doing a little bit of research on your website and watching your YouTube videos that even though you speak about bodybuilding, which is obviously quite an aesthetic sport, you definitely have a massive health focus mm -hmm. and it 100%. is about disease prevention and you mm -hmm. really care about the longevity and the, the long-term outcome of your patients, which, which is really cool. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, you know what? Western medicine is such a symptom-based product. I bandage. I was trained to bandage people, never trained to fix people. So a long time ago, about 12 years ago, I decided let's go after the cause of disease, not just a condition of illness. Mm -hmm. Let's fix people. And uh, you do that by giving them the power to do that. Yeah. Here's what you need to do for your situation. Have you ever had any pushback from like doctors within your area or anything like that coming back it on you saying – you can't do this. Like you're not, you're not prescribing correct medicine as we've been taught. Yes. You know, that's funny you say that. Um, I was with the Mayo Clinic in residency. And when I moved uh, up to where I live now in Idaho, I had a lot of the docs literally call me a quack mm. because I prescribed supplements and I suggested food over drugs. And if someone came in with a sore throat, I wouldn't just give them an antibiotic. I said, well, let's let's talk about what happened at work this week. Why did your immune system get down enough to get stressed? But I'm very happy to say all those same docs are now my patients. <laughs> so the tide turns. But yes, I did take a lot of hack for this back in the 90s and early 2000s, um, just trying to get people healthy. And Because drugs are – it's very necessary. Don't get me wrong. I'm not – cutting down Western medicine. If no. I get in a car wreck, I do not want my chiropractor in the ER. I want a Western trained doctor, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's a place for it, but really for preventative health maintenance, body attainment, physical fitness goals, it's a daily process. Mm -hmm. It's not an event. Yeah, definitely. It's the, the constant swim upstream, isn't it? You can never stop. Yes, exactly. And so something uh, that you keep, kept kind of touching on, something that we're finding a lot, like it seems like a lot of the common folk are starting to, or they just commonly don't eat enough food or they overeat certain types of foods. Um, how do you change someone's mindset when they come to you and you're like, well, hold up, you're really severely under eating and this is why you are holding your body fat. Like this is why your belly is staying the way it is. You can't just simply train more, eat less, and get results. So what's the kind of, I guess, approach and story that you take them on to kind of change their, their world around a little bit? Oh, that's an awesome question. So first you have to realize it is a lot more than calories into calories out. We've really been grown up and taught that if you eat too much, you get fat. If you exercise too little, you get fat. And the vice versa is true. Eat too little, get skinny. Exercise too much, get skinny, right? <laughs> Well, it's calories, I think, did and do have a small part of it. But I think just the evolution of technology and man not being able to keep up with that evolutionary-wise, if you will, that there's so many more factors that are being ignored. Yeah. For example, the, the, the effect of cortisol, the stress hormone on the brain, on the body, on your belly fat is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And because it's so different now, because we have these damn things, these mm -hmm. iPhones and cell pads and you know all these things that keep us awake at night, that constantly distract our attention. We feel we have to, every time it buzzes, you have to grab it. We have all these, I mean, even world events. You watch the news, you're going to go put a gun in your mouth because you get so depressed <laughs> with all the terrible things out there, right? Yeah. So cort cortisol is something you have to take in mind first. What is the stress level of this person and what's causing it? And I tell people, you know what, like I'll use Mrs. Jones. Mrs. Jones comes to me. I tell her, I can't change your stressors, but we can change the way your body deals with that stress. Mm -hmm. So first thing we do is understand their stressors and help them deal with it. That may be adaptogenic herbs that may be changing their sleep patterns that may be getting them to meditate or pray we start there dietary wise comes a very close second we make sure their guts working yeah. everyone's guts jacked up out there because of all the antibiotics the toxins and back to number one high cortisol levels destroy the good gut bacteria mm. and it destroys your ability to absorb protein and fats and so even though they may be eating too little or they're eating too much, they're not absorbing the good nutrients because their gut's messed up. So nutritionally, we try to fix the gut. We try to control cortisol to fix the gut. We look at all those different aspects of gut health to fix that, again, back in the goal to help them reach their body goals or health goals or whatever. 
all these are all these. I'm kind of talking about them in order, but really they all kind of go together as one. Yeah. Uh, the next thing we look at is toxins. Remember, to to me, and I, I did a, a a big part in my new book on this very thing. To me, it, it hit me about no oh, about eight years ago that fat. We've always looked at fat as very maladaptive, and so back to the calorie analogy. I eat too much or exercise too little. I get fat. That's a maladaptive thinking. Yes. I would say fat is adaptive. Mm-hmm. It's protective because mm-hmm. where does you – do you know and you guys know, you store all your toxins in your fat. If your mm-hmm. fat wasn't there, it'd build up in your brain and you'd build up in your heart. You'd die. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Look at the – I'll use bariatric surgery as, as an analogy. If you really look at the surgical data on some of these wonderful people that have – God-given anatomy altered by a guy with a knife, they have about a two-year mark where they'll either gain their weight back Mm -hmm. or die. There's a small percentage that actually maintains that leanness. And if you look at that small percentage, it's the exercisers. They're sweating toxins out. They've changed their environment. But if you don't change your environment, if you continue to be exposed to these toxins, no matter where they come from, you gain your fat back, even though your anatomy has been altered. Yes. And, 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 or if you don't, if you're not able to adapt to that toxins like you used to, people die. Yeah. And the data is pretty fascinating out there, and I see it all the time in practice, where people are eating right, exercising right, doing everything right. But until we clear toxins in their body, they never left, lost their abdominal fat. And- so just to confirm, like toxins could be something like mold within the house. It could be Pollution. gas fumes from even being on the street. It could be that you've had heavy metal, uh, like you've been introduced it's to heavy metals heavy. when you were younger. Uh, like it, it kind of covers a lot. It even comes down to like electric ma- magnetic fields. Uh, like there's a, a lot of things that can kind of really affect this side of things. And so just to kind of open up how big the picture is for people, I guess, so they understand that a bit more. Oh, exactly, man. It's, you nailed it. it to- we are continuously bombarded by toxins. Mm-hmm. In 1987, the EPA, the Environmental Protectors Agency here in America, released a report that the average American had and maintained 700 toxic chemicals in their body at any one time. That mm-hmm. was 1987, dude. That's 30 years ago. Mm-hmm. You can pretty much guarantee that number has increased by double, if not oh, quadruple. At least, yeah. At least. And yeah, that's those those come from everywhere. So again, again, unless you're willing to go move to the mountains and hunt your own food and grow your own food and just ignore everybody completely, you've got to help your body clear these toxins. Yeah. And part of that is lowering the cortisol, fixing the gut, and then using some supplements and God given things to help fix it. And it's it's a bigger picture thing. Mm. And and so, see, you got me on something, so now I'm going to go for a while here, but no, I'm sorry. Go for it, please. Um, <laughs> the, uh, if I may review with you, there's just uh, the effect of cortisol, the effect of the gut health, toxins, and then the next one's hormones. Mm-hmm. Hormones get a lot of blame and credit for things. For example, testosterone gets all the blame and credit for everything sexual, right? Yeah. It's a lot more than that. Now, guys, me and you, sir, yes, testosterone does dictate a little more, but that beautiful woman sitting next to you, there's no libido in the house if you forget to take the garbage out, sir. Yeah. Right? <laughs> there's there's more than just hormones per action. Hormones are involved in everything. So when you get this ill effect of cortisol, ill effect of toxins, ill effect of gut health, hormones go wacky. So when someone comes to me and says, Doc, I know my thyroid's off, but their numbers are perfect on the paper from the lab, mm-hmm. yet you look at all these other things I just discussed, their thyroid doesn't work. Mm-hmm. It really is. And so hormonal health has to be engaged and looked at too when you're looking at someone's completeness on their health. Yeah. So affect the cortisol, I call it the HPA axis, which stands for hypothalamic pituitary axis. Um, uh, we mentioned a little before we started adrenal fatigue. That falls under that. That's a very rare condition. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with the name, but I think it's appropriate because that's what people know. Yeah. Um, Adrenal fatigue occurs between the ears. It's the effect of cortisol on the brain that makes people feel so crappy. Um, Then we have gut health, toxin health, the effect of hormones. And the last one I like to bring in, and I really kind of fold it all together, this is oxidative stress. 
So is your body recovering from all the above? How, what are the oxidative markers that we can follow? And what's so cool about science is we have tons of markers where I can actually see how well people are recovering. Mm-hmm. I use oxidized LDL a lot. I use um, a couple markers of DNA breakdown. Uh, 808 DH, is, DG, excuse me, is my favorite one. We use these markers to follow, okay, is, the, is everything we're doing working? And so when you had that very good question on what is under eating, over eating, under exercising, over exercising, when people really go out, they set their goals to make a difference, be it their body, be it their health, be it lower their cholesterol, change their blood pressure, whatever. If you don't take those five factors into consideration, you get a short term effect. Mm. In other words, you, you get the people that lose weight for a short time and then gain it all back. Yeah. And that is because they, they ignored one of the five somewhere along the lines or they relied just on calories and then the body went holy crap you're not, i'm in starvation mode grab a bunch of that fat stick it on her ass and leave it there because she's going to try to do this again to us mm-hmm. right so so to flip it on the other end of the spectrum i guess is uh muscle gain and something that you'd work with a lot with bodybuilders is trying to put on size uh and that can pretty much put a lot of gastrointestinal pressure or stress on the body um, how do you kind of yes. deal with that for the person? Oh, that's a great question too. So I think everyone, no matter what your age, what your goals are, I think you should have a goal of building muscle. Mm. Muscle is the secret to longevity. Yeah. We know through some excellent studies that the muscle actually releases enzymes and proteins in the body to help regenerate. It increases telomere length, if you're familiar with DNA stuff. Telomeres are the end, their tip or end caps of DNA, and our, literally our longevity depends on how long those suckers are. Movement and building muscle keeps those bigger. It's muscles constantly regenerating. It's uh, the protein. That's why protein is so important in your diet, no matter what your source is. And we can talk about that too if you want in a minute here. But I think everyone's goal should be building muscle. Now, some people may want to build to the point of getting on stage. Yeah. But even my 75-year-old diabetic hypertensive ladies in a nursing home should try to build muscle. It's going to mm-hmm. lessen falls. It's going to maintain cognitive health. I'll give you an example. There was a great study, and forgive me, I can't remember the author, but he took 85-year-old women and had them resistance train with weights 20 minutes three times a week, and their cognitive scores went way up. Mm. It influenced the brain. Yeah. So everyone needs to build muscle. Now, you asked specifically about the gastrointestinal tract. Very, very good question because I do a lot of – we call them a poop test here in the, in the office. We yeah. have people collect poop, and we look, at every, we look at their microbiome. We look how they're absorbing protein and fats. We look at their pancreatic function. We look for inflammatory markers. We look for pathogenic bacteria and yeast and, and, and uh, uh, parasites and all sorts of things. So we do a lot of these poop tests, and the bodybuilding crowd all have the same poop. Now you think, well, that's because they're all drinking whey protein all the time. No, <laughs> it's – it's the if the stress of heavy training and exercise changes the gut. Yes. And so that's why it's so important. People that really want to build muscle but are having a heck of a time, you got to consider those five factors mm-hmm. I just talked about. You can't just eat more and more protein thinking it's going to put muscle on you or you can't just lift heavier and heavier and heavier because remember that's stress on the body. Yeah. And that now we're going back to number one. We're increasing, we're changing the HPA axis, causing stress, which is going to negate all my efforts. So it really is for building muscle, just like losing fat. You've got to consider all the the processes involved. Yeah, that's super cool. It, and it's awesome that it's pretty much no matter which angle you attack it from, you can always relate back to these five things, <clears throat> and that will kind of yes. really prove on how or it gets the best results. So it's like, hey. Guys, stop and think about how is your life right now? Like, are you stressed to a T? Yes. You're probably not going to get the results you want. Are you sleeping? If you're not, you're probably not going to get the results you want. And so it's um, it's good. Just everyone is starting to get onto this message, which is awesome because it's it's in the science. And so it's like, hey, yeah. if you're not doing these things, it's just not going to be there. I think some of those yeah. things can be quite straightforward to our listeners in terms of like, okay, I'm not sleeping enough, I get more sleep. But some of the stuff that might be a little bit more foreign is around how do they remove the toxins or how do they get the um, hormones back in balance and things like that. Can you sort of touch on that a little bit more for the listeners? Absolutely. Good. You guys are 
Good question. I love them. This is awesome. <laughs> so uh, let me start with the toxins. Huh? The, the best way to remove toxins from your body, sweat. Sweat. Sweat, 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 sweat. Now, that doesn't mean now people automatically equate sweat with spending three hours on the treadmill at a 15 degree grade out, uh, incline running nine miles per hour, right? No, I'm talking like infrared sauna. Yeah. Sitting in an infrared sauna, 20 minutes, three times a week. You should see the research on that and how it clears toxins, prevents cardiac disease, lowers blood pressure, improves hormonal health. Huge. But exercising also is a part of that. Getting yourself to sweat is the best way to do it. Number two, avoid toxins. If you are someone that, for example, used a great analogy um, – breathing all the fumes from outside. Let's say your job requires you to drive across town right behind a big diesel truck and you're just sucking the fumes down the whole time. Wear a mask. Get your windows resealed. Yeah. You know, don't don't let the air circulate from outside. Keep it recirculating inside. Do these things to avoid the toxins. Um, from your food, really avoid processed food. You know, use the the the, the one ingredient rule. If it has more than one ingredient, don't eat it, right? Yeah. And I always like to tell people, if you pick up a, a package and you cannot pronounce any of the words <laughs> on that package, you throw it out yeah. because that's a te- toxic chemical you don't need. There's great resources out there like the environmentalworkinggroup.org, EWG.org. They have a website that talks about makeups and shampoos and, and uh, 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 sunscreens. That, by the way, you guys use sunscreens more than we do. Right yeah. now, it's 19 degrees outside. I don't know what it is there, but it's 19 degrees here. So I wish I had some sunscreen. <laughs> but uh, anyway, Environmental Working Group, it's an online resource. It's free. Go in there and look at your products. See what mm. type of toxins you're putting on your lips, ladies, every day. Or men, what kind of deodorant are you using? Are you just sucking up stuff that's causing issues, inhibiting you from gaining the mass you want to gain? It, it's really impressive. So learn to clear the toxins, learn where the toxins are coming from, and avoid them, and then replace them with other stuff. To get a little more technical, and I'm sure you guys have some some docs down there, or at least some practitioners that yeah. can do testing. We can do heavy metal testing. We can look for persistent organic phosphates. We can look for all the gasoline products like ethobenzene and benzene. We can look for all that stuff in your system. But really, I can pretty much guarantee anyone that gets tested has this stuff, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, I, used to, I used to eat, uh, and honest truth, I spent 30 years eating three cans of albacore tuna every day. Mm-hmm. Do you know how high my mercury was? It was yeah. high. Let's just say yeah. that. I, I still have the Dane bramage from it. But <laughs> I can clear myself out of it. And then, you know, white rice. White rice is just loaded with arsenic. And what do CrossFitters and bodybuilders and people that are staying healthy do? We eat chicken and fish and rice, right? Yeah. Go buy the arsenic-free rice. You have to look for it. Mm-hmm. So there's ways to avoid it. But you can find a practitioner to look at it. And the other thing I'd have a practitioner do would be to look at your kidney and liver function. Make sure they're optimal mm-hmm. to keep your clearance good. You have to have optimal liver function, optimal kidney function to get those toxins cleared via those modalities we talked about. So that was the first part of your question uh, was on toxins. What was the second part again, hon? I'm sorry. Yeah, more about hormones. So if somebody, because you mentioned, you know, they might be feeling like their thyroid's out, but they come back from the doctor's office and their bloods are within range, which is super common. Mm-hmm. Um, not normal, yes. just common. <laughs> just Oh, it's so common. It makes me sad. So back to, and I'm, I'm telling you, it's my training. My Western medicine training is to look at a set of variables, numbers, low, high, Anything between equals normal, right? Yeah. Well, first of all, no one's ever been able to describe what normal means to me. <laughs> and number two, that range is usually so huge. Like, well, I'll use testosterone. The yeah. uh, <laughs> a normal testosterone now for, let's say, a 35-year-old male is 125 nanograms per deciliter to 1,300 nanograms per deciliter. That's a, that's a big-ass jump, yeah. It's huge. How do you find these normals? So – the best thing to do if you really want to test it is find a practitioner in your area that understands it's more than just a lab value. We have to listen to our patients. What's going on? Because I, you know, I had a preceptor uh, when I was with the Mayo Clinic that taught me. He had been practicing for 50 years. His name was Dr. Basie. And he said, Warren, if you just listen, the patient 
will give you the diagnoses. Yeah. Your job is just to name it. Hmm. And really, I've learned that in, in all the uh, years I've been practicing. I just have to listen. I know what hormones are off by listening to them. And so, our, okay, the paper doesn't match. The lab didn't match. Back to our five tenets of health. When the cortisol is high, you in, you uh, create more RT3, reverse T3. That's the uh, hormone made by the liver. I should say a protein made by the liver that prevents the active thyroid hormone T3 three from working so i don't care what the paper says what their lab values say if they're stressed their thyroid doesn't work they're telling you the truth yeah. right if if cortisol is high it inhibits the way that the the brain releases thyroid st- uh, stimulating hormone i mean the, i could go on and i don't want to bore you guys with terribly physiological details but we love the it. fact <laughs> of the matter is the uh Good people in your area or any area that's listening, find a practitioner that understands the bigger picture and doesn't treat labs, treats patients. Yeah. That's that's really the secret to it. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times, guys. I was going to say, if the listeners oh, are lost for that, then reach out. We've got a, a fair few well, I was just going to say, go up to Greg Emerson up here and then yeah. there's a few Shannon naturopaths Brenton. around as well. Yeah, yeah Shannon exactly. Brenton. So we have got a few practitioners over here, which is awesome. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that, that's so important because I'm sure like them, I've many times, or I should they like me, we've seen people with normal labs, but they come in with every symptom in the book. So you go ahead and start them on a low-dose thyroid medication to use that one as an example, and they get better. It yeah. really works. So, so does that mean they have to be on thyroid medication forever? No, that means you make them feel better so you can work on everything else. Yeah. Get the HPA axis back balance, get their gut fixed, get them away from toxins, fix the oxidative stress, and the hormones will adjust on their own. Yeah. You've got a really cool book called Better Than Steroids um, that you released. When did that come out? That came out in 2006, I believe. And so It's about 11 years old. I think the name in itself is, is huge, but then what you dive into in the book is all about health, and people, I think, coming from that realm aren't thinking about health, they're thinking about aesthetics purely. And so when they read a book like Better Than Steroids, like what, what's this going to be about? Yet you go in, you almost trick them, which is awesome. Um, can you kind of dive in a little bit deeper about what Better Than Steroids is? Sure. You know what? Um, having had the wonderful opportunity to work with so many bodybuilders and fitness uh, men and women, I really saw there was a real confusion on how to eat and mm. And drugs have always been an issue. They've always been around. People are always going to be taking them and whatnot. But you don't need them because they are the term. They're short term. Yeah. They only work while you're taking them. They do have issues with them. And I'm not condoning or condemning any steroid use. But really, the real secret is what you do day to day. So better than steroids about. Here's how to change up your exercise routine. There's a full chapter with 15 or 16 different methods of bodybuilding resistance training. And then the, the majority of the book focuses on different styles of eating. That What I hope you do with it is you find out which one works best for you. Mm. And then based on that, you can dial yourself into that lean look that you are after and maintain it because now you understand the style of eating that works for you. I didn't get too much into supplements or anything. I really focus on... Uh, the pre and post workout meal. This is the way to eat. Here's some exercise ideas. Good luck. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think that's such a big thing. Like nutrient timing, it's not going to be the same for each individual. And um, right. this is where it becomes such a hard thing because people are like, "Well, I just want that off the shelf meal plan that's going to help me. How do I do it? Where do I find it?" And it's like, "Well, no. That's why there are so many different types of." of uh, nutrition protocols, I guess. Like that's why some people thrive on keto, whereas other people thrive yep. on carb backloading diet. or <laughs> vegan or yeah. And then you'll find someone who tries vegan who gets incredibly sick or who tries keto and gets incredibly sick. And it's like, because yes. your genetics are not set and ready for that. Like that's not where you should right. be. Um, what's your approach with, I guess, finding someone for that? Like where do you oh. start someone? So if for the super technical and scientific based, we can do genetic testing to see if you're a better fat metabolizer or better carb metabolizer. Mm. Um, if we decide not to do that, I will look at something called an APOE. It's a genetic test that actually determines heart risk and Alzheimer's disease. But based on that genotype or that uh, what we call your alleles, I can tell you using another number called SDLDL, which stands for small dense lipoprotein, uh, the the bad cholesterol, 
based on those two numbers, I can tell you how well you me- metabolize carbs versus fats. Yeah. So then, right then and there, if I do those tests, okay, you need to be this amount of carbs in your diet, this amount, of, based on your activity level. Well, that that's what adjusts carbs. But then we keep it a stable, this amount of protein and fat. If we decide not to go into all the testing and whatnot, then really it's trial and error. Yeah. Let's see, what we're, what do you feel better on? And this is back to listening to the patients. People will tell you, yeah, I do a no carb and I lean up, but man, I, my brain's so fuzzy, I can't think, mm. I don't feel that well. Okay, guess what? You probably shouldn't be keto then. Mm. Whereas other people get on keto and say, I feel so good, I can't stand it. You know, I don't need to do genetic testing to know that they're utilizing fat yeah, well, exactly. as their energy source. So it's most people out there know what their best for them. Now it's just fine tuning it. Mm. And if you really want to get into the science, you can do some testing that will help you do that. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it is. It's super cool. Because um, the power of the mind is so strong and, and thought processes can control outcomes and chemical release and all that kind of good stuff. When you go through those five with people, whether they're looking for fat loss or muscle gain or both, and we say, okay, well, stress is going to prevent you from achieving those results. Do you find that that tends to stress people out more hmm. <laughs> because they they start overthinking, like overanalyzing everything, and then that in itself causes more stress? Or do you find that the supplementation and the other like meditation and things can help that and prevent that from happening? That would be a yes and a yes. Some yeah. people, especially our wonderful type A, OCD, ADD type person, <laughs> I tend to stress them out by telling them they're stressed, yes. <laughs> but the the adaptogenic herbs, uh, changing some lifestyle things, taking 10 minutes a day and just close your eyes and count your breaths yeah. does wonders for it. Um, I'm real hip on the ap- adaptogenic herbs. I use them in everybody that has stress issues. They really work. So things There's like ashwagandha? Blind- ashwagandha, I love. Relora. Uh, L-theanine, which is God's Valium, greatest thing ever out there. Um, Rhodiola, holy basil. I mean, the list goes on and on. All these, and it depends on how the person presents Mm -hmm. as to which ones I would suggest. But yes, they really work, especially when we look at the big picture and we're covering those other aspects of health. Those supplements really, really show themselves. But again, it's back to Okay, I'm stressing you out with telling you your stress, but let's work on it together. How about someone with like body dysmorphia? Do these uh, herbs work really well for someone like that who is looking at themselves and saying, you know what, I'm just, I'm not seeing what I actually am right now. You know, body dysmorphic disorder is a tough one to deal with, and yeah. bless the hearts of the people that have it. I think, I think any of us that exercise hard have at least a small degree of it. Yeah, definitely. We don't always see what everyone else sees. Um, but I think that's also part of health is accepting who you are mm. and where you are and always being willing and trying to grow from there. And so with some of the people that I've had that are anorexics or bulimics or even the bodybuilders that, you know, they walk in and look like He-Man, but they think they're, you know, it's Gilligan from Gilligan's Island. I mean, they're just <laughs> tiny. So we just, you just got to walk them through that. You know, you're beautiful the way you are. Let's just feel better. And you know, that's one of the keys to it. Mm -hmm. The first thing any doctor, any health practitioner, any nutritionist, personal trainer should do is help people feel better first. Yeah. I learned that a a long time ago. I, people used to come to me and I'd give them this detailed exercise program and eating plan and supplement schedule and adjust their hormones. But if they didn't feel good, it was useless. Yeah. So Honestly, in my first, sometimes even two or three visits into someone coming to me who are really in bad shape, I don't even prescribe exercise because that's just going to make them feel worse right away. Mm -hmm. Let's get you feeling better. And that's, that's, I think, something we should all, as practitioners, be working on. Yeah, let's get some, let's get people feeling better because when they feel better, they're going to be more inclined to take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and with the, and with the body dysmorphic disorder, like themselves. Yeah. If they feel better. Yeah, we also find the other side of it. If people are based just on aesthetics, that they tend to not really ever achieve their goals. Um, it's like short lived. Exactly, it's very short lived, and it's easily broken. Like it's not a it's not a big enough thing to work towards. Whereas where, if you find that deeper why. Yeah, exactly. Or even just focusing on performance because it usually gives someone a goal to work towards by a certain date. So it's for instance, 
in CrossFit realm. Hey, the Open's coming up next year in February. We know it's starting the end of Feb, so essentially you've got 12 weeks to work towards it. How are you going to get after it? And it makes that drive a little bit better than if they're like, you know what, I really want a six pack. <laughs> right. It's like right. The You're exactly right. <laughs> the byproduct of working hard for your performance goals. Yeah, exactly. That's funny you say that. We tell people all the time, weight loss, a six-pack, striations in your quads, those are side effects of you being healthy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, awesome. that's good. Yeah. So on the other side of things is the actual use of drugs. And it's something that people kind of go to because for whatever reason, they, they feel that it's necessary. Um, within CrossFit, the, the guy who came third in 2017, uh, he was caught for having SARMs. And we asked about it before the show. Can you kind of dig in a little deeper? Like what sounds, what what are the benefits that he would have been getting from having this product? Sure. SARM stands for Selective Androgen Receptor Modulator. So in medicine, we've used SERMs, Selective Estrogen Receptor Modulators, for years Mm -hmm. to protect bone health. Um, They're used... Uh, as a cancer agent following breast cancer. there's uh, These are not new drugs. Basically what they do, they bind the, the SARMs in particular, bind the androgen receptor and cause a lot of the same benefits that an anabolic androgenic steroid would do. Increases lean mass, increases nitrogen retention, increases uptake of nutrients, you know, everything these things do, but without a lot of the androgenic or what people consider the side effects of steroids, the SARMs don't tend to have as much. Now, I say tend because I have seen side effects with SARMs, right? So really, it is about, I want to say two years ago, uh, WADA, the World Anti-Doping Association, put SARMs on their list. Mm. And so I'm sure with the CrossFit uh, um, regulations, whatnot, that's one of the Drugs that was banned, obviously, yeah. if he's having an issue with it. So that's what SARMs do. They bind the androgen receptor in hopes to cause the positive benefits of, of anabolic steroids without the side effects. And so they're, – they're, Oh, sorry. I was going to say like if, if it's working within the body, how good of an effect can it have? Or how big of an effect? You know – it's going to have some effect. I've seen some people that have done SARMs that have just responded wonderfully. In other words, to gain five or 10 pounds of lean mass while they're on them. They tend to lose it when it comes off because it's a temporary thing. Mm. Uh, but in the majority of people with SARMs, I think they feel a little better. I don't see a lot of the really powerful effects. And that can be based on the argument that anabolic androgenic steroids, some of the most androgenic st- steroids are the ones that cause the most effect now they're also the ones with the most side effects Mm. so there's again everything in life's on a teeter-totter or a bell-shaped curve you know you get too much a little something is bad too much of something's bad and so you're going to find this happy place in the middle and is there an aspect of obviously speeding up recovery to allow people to continue to train harder and faster and back to back yeah you know and it's funny you say that because just like we talked about better in steroids earlier I the, the difference between someone who uses steroids and who doesn't, besides the obvious, besides the water retention, the increased mass, the increased strength, is the recovery aspect. Really, if you looked at anabolic androgenic steroids and the entire list of things they do beneficial, it can be summed up with the word recovery. So if you're eating right, exercising, sleeping well, keeping your stress low, balancing your hormones, all that, you have the same recovery as someone on steroids without the side effects. Mm -hmm. You really do. And that's why I have seen many an athlete out there who are natural as the day is long, no drugs, who are in such better shape than the drug takers. And they maintain it all the time. And so, yes, there may be a short-term benefit in recovery by using SARMs and using anabolic androgenic steroids. But in the big picture, back to our basics we talked about, is the real secret. And it's a real differentiator between the number one and number two person out there in any sport is how well do they have those five things tuned into. Because really, you know, as we talked earlier, the drugs are everywhere. Yeah. And you look at some sports and they're just, everyone's on drugs. Well, why does one person win all the time? Well, they have other stuff t- tuned in. Is there a genetic component? Of course there is. But genetics to me are more like a light switch on a dimmer. 
I may have genetics to have heart disease, but it's my lifestyle that turns that switch on. And then it's how I live day to day that turns that dimmer up, Mm -hmm. right? And it's the same for physiques. You may have genetics to be not the greatest CrossFitter in the world, but if you're training right, recovering well, doing all this, you are going to be dang good. You're going to be spectacular, right? So it's still up to you. Yeah. And and that's that's what I love to push on people because I've seen it. I've seen people with terrible genetics win everything, and that's in every sport out there. And I know I do genetic testing. I can tell you, <laughs> this guy wasn't supposed to do this, and he did it. Yeah. So that's awesome. So the yeah. effort matches the results. Yes. Yeah. So on the other side of things, is uh, <clears throat> you got me thinking while you were talking about that was athletes who get away with eating whatever they want. So in inverted commas, because it's uh, like you'll see people, for instance, on a big competition weekend, they'll go out and they'll completely binge. Like they're in the middle of a comp, yet they'll be a, they'll be able to get away with eating pizzas and eating ice creams and bits and pieces of whatever they want to have. Um, Drinking alcohol. Oh, it's like how does that how does that respond with with the athlete then? So we have to define some terms here. Getting away with we have to define, and I like to mm. define it long term. They may <laughs> get away with it right now, then they'll come and see me in five years. Yeah, and when it catches up to them, right. Number two, yes, there are some people that appear to get away with it, but really when you look at them in the detail, we look at them physiologically, metabolically, using lab tests, using the, all the different studies and modalities we have to really look at a person's health, they are not healthy. Mm-hmm. They may be getting away with it on the outside, but on the inside, all the heck and havoc that's going on is still going on. You know, I used, I ran a huge weight loss clinic for years, and we used to tell people how blessed they were they were fat. And they'd look at me and go, what, are you crazy? I'm not coming to you, you moron. And I say, no, 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 listen. Listen, your body told you something's wrong. Mm-hmm. That's why you're fat. Let's fix it. Those people that don't get fat, don't get – that stay what appears to be healthy and they're still doing that binging, be it alcohol, food, whatnot, they're not being warned. You know how those people show up in my office? After their first heart attack. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's how those people show up. And if you look at the data, if you look at a lot of the men in particular, especially the younger men who have heart disease and whatnot, they, they're not the fat, out of shape slobs we tend to think of. It tends to be people that got away with it, yeah. right? And now they show up to my office after their first MI. And so it's really tricky to help somebody in that mindset because if their performance is going well, you know, they're smashing local competitions and they look healthy and they feel fine, yet in eating all those foods, they're causing sickness later down the track, uh, you know, one, two, five years. And I guess we're in the same realm as you because we're like health practitioners and we're working with people. We see this all the time, so we know that it's not good for them. But how do you get somebody who's in that mindset? I'm of, performing well, so what's it matter? Yeah, like why should I change? Why should I look at prevention? Like that's kind of the hardest battle, right? It's a very hard battle. Um, some of the labs we use, especially the oxidative stress labs I mentioned earlier, are of great benefit mm-hmm. because they may look that way, feel that way, great, but we're starting to see early markers that they're going to be in trouble later. I've had some people change on that dime. Mm-hmm. Other people, you just can't convince. They, mm-hmm. They're they very happy where they're at, and so they're going to stay there. And you just say, well, call me later. Yeah. I'll be around. I tried to and they eventually, they, <laughs> trust me, I've been doing it long enough to tell you they will come back to you eventually. Hmm. And so Every if, one of them. For performance-based, do you... Like, what are your thoughts on things like gluten and dairy for performance base? Like, how do they how do they respond on performance levels? I think you know because of the again back to what I talked about earlier in our discussion, the bigger picture of stress in society, how with technology and the evolution of everything around us, our body's not there. Gluten's a different it's a different molecule than it was 50 years ago. It mm. is a different species. Milk products too. Our bodies, if the gut's not healthy, then gluten and milk, a lot of things are going to be an issue, right? Mm -hmm. 
So it's not really, I don't want to blame gluten. I don't want to blame milk. I want to say it's the person's inability to utilize those appropriately now. Or gluten now, because their gut health is so bad, because cortisol is so high, and they have so many toxins in their butt, they get what what's called a leaky gut and now gluten is causing a uh, reactive autoimmune uh, reaction to it in other words the body sees it as foreign and then it turns and attacks the thyroid and now you have autoimmune thyroiditis from eating gluten well it's again it's not the gluten's fault it's the fact that your lifestyle has changed your gut and now your immune system has attacked it and now it's attacking your thyroid and so, yes, I think it's a very good idea in today's world, especially if your goal, if you're starting out to get healthy, avoid all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Get rid of the gluten, get rid of the milk, get rid of the known toxins, get rid of everything that's pretty obvious. Do more detailed testing to find out what you need to be on. Do a food allergy test and look and then get yourself better because it's, again, back to that whole recovery idea of anabolic steroids. If you're recovering, then it doesn't matter that you're eating gluten. Because you're recovering from it. Your gut can handle it again. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah. yeah so yeah. it's that, – that's the way I try to look at it. I don't – I have friends that are practitioners that just – everyone that walks in their door, they take off gluten and whatnot. And I'm like, you know, that's that's hard and that's expensive. And can they do that for the rest of their lives? No. So why don't we fix them? So if they do get yeah, – as a general rule, avoid gluten, yeah. But if they get into it, it doesn't bother them, mm. right? It doesn't hurt them like it would have. Yeah, And I guess coming back to the one ingredient rule, if they're following that, then they wouldn't really eat processed foods like bread anyway. So Exactly. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. yeah. And so I guess on that as well as talking about um, healing the gut, and it's something that's getting thrown around a lot now, um, basic things such as like eating some fermented foods or drinking some fermented drinks, um, starting to eat a healthier diet is going to help you guys out with this. You can't just... Um, eat eat shit but then have a little bit of sauerkraut each day and expect that it's going to do the job. It's like, no, you need to look at like Dr. Warren Willie's saying here, you need to look at the bigger picture. You need to look at everything and that's going to help to heal the gut. It's not just a, where's this magic pill that's going to help me, unfortunately. Oh, you're right on, my friend. Yeah, we we teach our all of our patients and clients how to make their own kumbacha, how to make their own homemade yogurt and kefir. And, but, and most of them do it because we got some really cool recipes, but if they don't change everything else, they come back to say that stuff didn't work. Yeah. Well, what did it, what? Tell me about the rest of your day. Oh well, okay. So that three and a half minutes of you drinking your cup of kombucha didn't work. Let's, duh, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> um, I think as athletes, and we see this across all sports, uh, when you're giving a lot to your sport or your fitness, uh, it's also taking a lot away from you. And something that probably people don't use enough is magnesium. Um, yes. What is the best way, like in, in from what you've seen, is a cream, a gel, orally taking a powder or making like a, a ZMA mix? What's kind of the best way for someone to have magnesium that you've seen? Oh, I love it, my friend. I have a full lecture. I go into high schools in the area and talk about magnesium replacement because everyone's deficient. Mm. Everyone's deficient. So I'll give you a magnesium 101, and you guys know this, and I'm sure most of your listeners do, so forgive me if it's too rudimentary. But really, I, I think everyone's magnesium levels should be checked, and you need to have your practitioner do a RBC magnesium, a red blood cell magnesium. Magnesium is an intracellular mineral. And so if you look at serum levels in a standard blood test, it's false. It doesn't Mm. matter because the body's going to keep it intracellular. So you have to actually look at magnesium levels in the cell. Number two, because it's so deficient in our diet, everyone does need replacement. Oral replacement tends to cause the runs, especially the when they're magnesium oxalates or uh, whatnot, because, uh, citrates. I mean, mag citrate, we still use in the hospital for constipated people, for heaven's sakes, right? Yeah. So it causes the bowels to whoop. So I, when we do oral, I tend to use magnesium glycinate. It tends to be a little less bowel effective. And then for overall replacement, I have my athletes do a couple things. One, I have them sit in an Epsom salts bath in the hottest water they can stand at least once or twice a week Mm -hmm. because you absorb magnesium through your skin magnificently. Wonderful way to do it. As far as topical creams and gels, love them. 
I do a mag chloride 10% gel on all my athletes. We mix it with B vitamins. We call it the red. It, we were, we joke after that, the steroid cream, the clear that was out a few years ago. If you remember the baseball players doing it, we call this the red because it's bright red with the B vitamins. <laughs> the B vitamins but yeah. you, you put that on your skin, it sucks it right up. The red disappears in front of your eyes because your body sucks it right in. Great way to place replace magnesium. Magnesium, it's involved in over 300 different activities, physiological activities in your body. So it is absolutely needed. And exercisers, especially CrossFitters, because they train so intently, burn through that stuff like it's no tomorrow, yeah. right? So you have to replace magnesium. So any good pre-workout supplement drink or protocol should include magnesium, as should any post-workout supplement or protocol include magnesium to replace it. If you get too much in your system, you tend to just run to the restroom more often. You can get mag toxic, but it takes a quite a lot to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so I really don't worry about it. And that's why I like to check levels. If I check an RBC magnesium, I can tell you exactly how much you need to replace and how often. And so how about if someone's using a spray and they get that itchy feeling after spraying it on them? Uh-huh. Yes, it, that's usually more the carrier whatever the spray is in versus the actual magnesium. Okay. Because if you, ch if you change forms, change it to a cream or a gel, uh, or just go sit in an Epsom salt bath, you're not going to have the same reaction. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I actually got told a few years ago, and I think it was by someone who was trying to sell the, the spray, is that it would happen every time that your body didn't need magnesium within that, that space. And so that's, uh, that's very interesting. It's like, no, that was just their sales tactic. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Question everything. <laughs> that's right. Yes, ma'am. But um, like, I guess on a, on a performance level, you can see things such as like uh, a muscle tear can be because of someone's not having enough magnesium. Um, like simple signs like cramping and, and stress, like, oh, sorry, like fractures or... Um, like a sprain or something like that, that can all be related to how much magnesium you guys are getting in. So that's definitely something to have a look at in the long run. Yes, very true. And and women tend to, when they're low in mag, they tend to be low in iron. And so when women tell me, they come in, especially women athletes, and say, my legs feel real heavy. Almost universally, they're iron and mag deficient. Yeah. Oh, universally. I'll just say it's universal. If, if a female athlete comes in with that complaint, they're low on mag and iron. And yes, you're right on, my friend. When people have recurrent injuries, they're not recovering as well, their brain's not into it, those can all be magnesium related. Yeah. But not all supplements are created equal, right? So if they feel like, okay, I need to get on some iron supplements, I need to get on some, some mag supplements, and also you were saying your preferred type of magnesium, but if they were to walk into like general supermarket and just buy off the shelf supplements, they're not going to be at therapeutic dosage. Yeah. Right. So I, um, I order most of our supplements from, um, pharmacies. So I, they're, they're under the FDA, uh, which in America is a governing body of all drugs. And when pharmacies sell supplements, they are pharmaceutical grade. Yeah. Now, if you, if you don't have that luxury, then I would suggest you go to a website called consumerlab.com, one mm -hmm. word, consumerlab.com, and they will rate the supplement for you yeah. based on, I think it's five different things. I think it's price, purity, adultification, content um so how much is there and then there's one more and i can't remember but that's a great resource consumerlab.com and find the best supplement in your area that meets all the criteria of appropriate and that's how i would shop if you don't have direct access to pharmaceutical grade yeah awesome and so that something else you touched on was the b vitamins um the happy herbs how how like should someone be taking b vitamins should everyone be taking b vitamins or do you think it's a, a specific case, case. yeah um, I think in general, all athletes, so probably most of the population listening to your wonderful podcast here should be on B vitamins. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, B vitamins are kind of your activators. They, they turn things on, right? So it, it's amazing. We burn through those pretty quickly too. There's a couple instances where I would absolutely say B vitamins are necessary and that is heavy or 
in, intense exercisers and anyone on hormone replacement, specifically the sex hormones. Mm -hmm. So even the, the meatheads out there taking anabolic steroids need to replace B vitamins because taking those hormones burns through it. So that goes to women on birth control. That goes to uh, women uh, who are menopausal taking estrogen. You, do, you lack B vitamins. So you are definitely people that need those. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. That's really interesting. Um, on the other side of things, I actually heard you telling a story about a guy who was a bodybuilder and he was going into a show and he was injecting insulin even though he didn't necessarily need to be injecting insulin. Can you touch on why he was doing that and, and I guess what insulin like, – it's kind of looked at as a bad – Bad thing every once in a while, isn't it? It's just too much it's, of it like, in the yeah. body. It's been given a bit of a bad rap. But can you kind yeah. of, I guess just tell the story. I think it's really cool. It funny. <laughs> sure. Yeah, true story. So it, actually I wrote an article that was uh, published in the Physician and Sports Medicine, October 1997. Uh, so a long time ago, 20 years ago, if people are interested in reading the article, uh, it's called Insulin as an Ergogenic Aid. And the story was I was, I was at dinner uh, with a professional bodybuilder at the time uh, down in Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, it was my um, – just recent became my wife, Dari at the time, and then him and his girlfriend. And we were sitting around having dinner, and – oh, we just froze up. Are you guys still there? Yeah, yeah, yeah we're still here. Yeah. yeah, we can hear you. Oh, good. I'll keep talking. Tell me to shut up if, I, if, I, if you lose me. <laughs> um, we were having dinner, and he just wasn't looking. And he was peaked. He was white in the face. He was sweating. I'm just kind of looking at him going, you don't look too good. Well, of course, our dinner was delayed, and it was not a restaurant that served bread or chips, so we were in trouble. And all of a sudden, he got up, and he kind of stumbled out the door. And I followed him out to see what was the matter, and he literally collapsed. And just the sweat, his pulse was racing. It was 150-plus. This guy's in top shape too, right? Mm -hmm. Just great shape. And uh, I asked his girlfriend, what, what, has he been doing something different? I mean, because I knew the drugs he was on. I knew what supplements he was taking, whatnot. She goes, well, you know, he's been injecting this stuff before he eats this last couple months. And I was like, oh, crap, he's taking insulin. And we didn't get food in us in time. So I had the maitre d' get some um, sugar with some water, and I mixed it. I literally made a paste in my fingers, and I stuck my hand in his mouth and just rubbed this paste, sugar paste around his buccal membranes on his cheeks and side and had the maitre d' call the ambulance because I knew he'd need some glucagon to get him out of the the insulin coma he was going into. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that prompted me to start really looking into – okay, is this pretty common? And I really started finding, gosh, there are a lot of athletes in every sport starting to use insulin. Well, that's because insulin is truly one of the most anabolic growth-promoting muscle-building hormones there is out there. Honestly, it makes growth hormone look like water. <laughs> the problem is with insulin, without people taking it, insulin is either your best friend or it's your worst enemy. Mm -hmm. If you eat right, if you time your food appropriately, uh, for example, a good post-workout meal, insulin is your best friend. It's going to take all those nutrients and shove them in your biceps. If you're eating bad, you're eating a lot of sugars, whatnot, it's going to stick it in your belly or your butt, right? Yeah. So insulin is a very, very, very powerful hormone. It's one of the five primary lifestyle hormones that we talk about in my practice to help get people understanding the effect of these hormones on every other thing that goes on in your body. So learning how to eat can be as, as important as learning what to eat because of the power of insulin. Yeah. And I think that goes, like something you just talked about was, or something you said a few times is like your pre and post food. What are you eating before you train? What are you eating after you train? Um, and I guess the, the best way to look at this is the things that make you feel the best is the best thing for you to eat. However, is there a protocol that you tend to use for someone who's like, for instance, a CrossFitter, someone who is going to go and do a high glycolytic exercise, what do you kind of, Describe for them as a pre-workout. A uh, pre-workout, you know, I love um, a combination of curcumin. Um, I use, um, I just lost the name, uh, beetroot. Mm -hmm. I use, um, gosh darn it, I just forgot my own favorite supplement list. Uh Anyway, um, I use some. <laughs> oh no, you're good. You're good. You know, I, this stuff's usually on the tip of my tongue. Um, anyway, I use um, ribose, D ribose. Mm -hmm. I use vitamin C. 
I, I have a little concoction is what I'm getting at for yeah. pre-workout. And then I adjust dosing on some of these things based on the athletic event, how long it's going to occur, what type of event it is. Is this an endurance event? Is this a purely strength event? Is this a speed event? Is this a combination event? And, and really, I'm not too much into a lot of the stimulants pre-workout because any stimulant causes a crash. Yeah. So we use a lot of these. I, I call them the mitochondrial energy sources. So we really try to feed the mitochondria with these basic sources and each one of the ingredients improves improves mitochondrial function at all levels d ribose for example directly in the car myocardium in the heart <laughs> um, for post-workout it's it's the rapidity at which we cause insulin to rise so i tend to focus more on liquid post-workouts rather than something you chew but that's very interdependent and and depending on the routine you're in and again back to the exercise program but you need a good mixture of protein carbs and just a little bit of fats in there again depending on what you're doing and what your baseline is and that is to stimulate those anabolic growth promoting hormones insulin in particular and to help you recover you want Remember, the insulin is cortisol's antagonist. So we just raised cortisol real high by a hard training session. We want to get insulin in there to lower that cortisol quickly to help us recover quicker. Mm -hmm. I saw a study recently that was saying that uh, reasonably high fats post-workout can actually be really good for testosterone uh, replenishment or boosting um, in turn, which is really good for, I guess, like HGH. Have you seen this at all? Yes, sir. As a matter of fact, I wrote a book in 2011 called The Tea Club. And The Tea Club is all about testosterone replacement in men, male hormone replacement. I wrote the entire book to focus on one chapter, and that is how to raise testosterone naturally with food. Mm -hmm. And I have a full what we call all the tea club diet or tbt for testosterone boosting therapy compared to trt which is testosterone replacement therapy to teach people how to raise testosterone naturally and i have hundreds of case examples lab based proof that eating this style which includes exactly what you just said raises testosterone doubles if not triples it in some people hmm. some men and that's but there's a big picture there too there's not only do the higher fats post workout and whatnot and the higher fats in general raise testosterone but when you get a person eating the TBT diet, it lowers cortisol. Yeah. It changes gut fat. It yeah. changes oxidative stress. It, or it does all these other things that also boost testosterone. And that's really the power of the food and raising testosterone. Yeah, yeah there's a whole subject I could go on forever and ever on because, yeah, the, the book – I think it's a really good book if you want to understand the whole world of testosterone replacement, legitimate testosterone replacement, I should say, um, <laughs> in, in, in a doctor's office. But really, the whole reason I wrote the book was so people had an alternative to taking testosterone. Now, you've got seven books. Uh, what? Where can people find all these books? So where I will – about to launch a new website, and I don't know if I'm allowed for my marketer to give you the name yet, but right now, if you go to drwilly.com, um, you can see most of them on there. Oh, there you guys are again. Hi there. Oh, I'm, glad I wasn't, again. I'm glad I wasn't picking my nose when you guys came back on there. Good that was close. I was thinking of it. Oh, well, anyway. Um, well, we can see uh, you Dr. the whole time. Oh, could you really? Oh, boy. Uh-oh. <laughs> Sorry about that, girl. Anyway, um, so that has uh, better in steroids, what's your doctor look like naked, uh, the Z diet, which is kind of a – the Z diet's more how to maintain weight loss once you've achieved it. Mm -hmm. It has the T Club to it. It has a book called 10W, which stands for 10 weeks, and that's a brand-new book. Uh, we're just getting out there. Yeah, cool talks about nutrition fitness and faith for men just about the importance of everything it's just not eating right and exercise it's mm -hmm. relationship health it's all those stuff and then my late my newest book uh, fat to fit to fat um will all be on there those these two i have not released on the website yet because i'm doing some beta testing with them okay um uh, the fat to fit to fat book was huge and I've cut it down to about 300 pages and I'm still trying to get some feedback. Is this too technical? Is it understandable? So all those will be released, um, or at least the first five are available right now. And then those last two will be out real soon. And so at what point do you think you'll have a new website? Is that it? 
I'm I'm hoping the end of February. Okay. Cool. But right now, if anybody and Phil, you're wonderful listeners. If anybody wants to email me, ask me questions, I'm very blessed. I get to spend a couple hours every day just answering emails from people all over the world. It's so much fun. I love it. And it makes me learn too. They ask great questions. So I got to go, oh crap, I better look that up. And uh, I love it. So if anybody wants to email me, you're welcome to. If you have any questions or if I can help you find a doctor in your area that does what I do, be happy to use some of the resources I have to to do that. And I guess some of the other resources you provide that are amazing, um, your YouTube channel, uh, watching over just the, the series that you put out, there's a, a whole heap of really cool information in that. And you've been on a fair few podcasts. Yeah, a fair few podcasts, the books as well, um, but then also your blogs. There's a lot of stuff on, on just your straight website. So uh, for the listeners, if you if you want to further your knowledge from what we've already talked about today, then that's a really cool place to start. Dive in deeper. Yeah, definitely. Um, what we'll do is we'll, we'll start to wrap up. But we've got two last questions that we ask all of our guests. So sure. the first one is, what is your biggest drive? What get, what gets you going? You know what? That's a great question. I, I, I'll i set my wonderful children and my beautiful wife aside here because they're my main drive in life. But for my profession, I would say seeing someone see positivity in themselves, seeing that they can – have a better life by their actions. That is just such a thrill to me. It's such a light switch. You just watch people, at least in my practice setting where I'm sitting one-on-one with a patient in a room, and I like spending a good, you know, I spend an hour with every patient. Mm. And when you see that light switch go on, it literally, it's, I I could make me cry right now thinking about it because it's such a, it's such a beautiful thing that, oh, I'm okay. I can do this. I can feel better. That is, that is what drives me to keep doing what I'm doing. Uh, it's just so neat to see that people have the power. I think the, the medicine world in particular has taken power away from people. The, yeah. the image of a doctor up on a pedestal is still very, very prevalent. Mm. And the image I have a prescription pad with a DEA license is very power invoking in some. And I think that's a bunch of horse pucky personally. I think the power is in you. You just have to be steered in the right direction. Yeah. So with all my rambling and books and all this stuff, if I see someone, if I see that light switch click, that's why I do it. Because then they're on, then guess what? They don't need me anymore. And that's yeah. the goal. You've done your yeah. job. <laughs> you know, in Japan, uh, doctor means the teacher. And so in yeah. Japanese culture, if they never, if they ne- oh, sorry, if they ever get sick, they actually fire their doctor because the doctor hasn't taught them how to be well. Um, and yep. I think that's a, an awesome way to look at it. And like it's empowering to see how well you're doing with your patients and just the amount of knowledge that you can kind of provide within an hour is, mm. is huge and very beneficial, which is unreal. And a very evident passion, which is yes. amazing. Yeah. Oh, thank common you. That you see that in doctors these days. So <laughs> that's yeah. cool. Um, and so then the final question is what's your biggest fear? You know, I would say the biggest fear is that this brand of medicine doesn't con- continue to grow, that it gets sequestered, mm-hmm. that the, at least in my country, that the government puts all supplements under the pharmaceutical power, um, that they, that the insurance companies and, and just the whole thing with payer sources changes to make this type of care less accessible to people. That's scary Mm -hmm. because I think health is so bad right now because of what we've been doing. Mm -hmm. And little radicals, people like myself, and I know a number of other docs around our country that are really pushing for let's get people healthy. Let's base our payment sources on health, not disease. Mm -hmm. There's just not the same kind of money in that. You know, there's no money in preventing someone from having osteoarthritis of the knee in 10 years. There's money in replacing that knee. Yeah. So why would I prevent that from happening? That's the thought out there that scares me. If that gets pushed, and I think all of us chronic exercisers, CrossFitters, nutritionists and stuff need to keep pushing our message hard because I think when people hear it, it clicks. Yeah. But if people don't hear it, they're going to just go to their doctor every time they have a sniffle for an antibiotic to ruin their gut, which ruins their hormones. Uh, you see the vicious cycle. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And so I guess for the listeners, if it hasn't already 
clicks, um, <laughs> really start to look at like the longevity, look at the health uh, as a long-term thing. It's not just about like, well, this tastes really good, so I'm going to eat it now. And even if I feel bad tomorrow, it doesn't really matter. It's like, well, no, look at the long-term side yeah. of effects. They're the warning bells and start telling to, you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Start to dive in and see the cause, like you were saying, not just, uh, not just here's a tablet just to take. So it's like all about prevention yeah. in the long run and I guess overall health, which is massive. But if you guys did enjoy this episode, please share it around because Dr. Warren, this has been amazing. We've, we've had such a good hour with you. It's been really cool. Yeah. It's oh, it's been my pleasure. You two are awesome. Thank you. It's great awesome. to speak with like-minded individuals. And, and see that, yes. that I think like you're talking about, there's a lot of people starting to push for it, which is really good. Obviously, there's a lot more people out there that are not seeing it yet, but hopefully if we can all start to demonstrate uh, what good health is, they'll see it as well as hear about it. So, um, yeah, keep fighting the good fight, man. You're doing unreal. You too, my friends. Very Thank much you. so. And what's your email address? Because you mentioned people can email you. Um, Absolutely. Real real simple because I ain't that sharp. It's doc at drwillley dot com. Doc at drwilly dot com. Perfect. And yeah, and anybody who emails me who's listening, just drop these good people's name, um, drop the cheap life so I know where it's coming from. And yeah, I'd be happy to answer you back. And do me a favor, everybody. If I don't respond within 24 hours, please send it again. I'm not ignoring you, but I get just enough that I don't get all, to all of them every day. And so if you send it again, it'll come back to the top of the list and I'll get to it. Yeah. I was like, as from experience, you were very quick to respond, which is unreal. It's awesome. Yeah, I, I try to stay on top of it. It's a lot of fun. I really enjoy email because it's a great way to share ideas and get to know people like you guys, and it's yeah. cool. So your website, your email, is there anywhere else that people can follow you? Do you do social medias or anything like that? You know, I'm not that bright with social media. I'm learning. I have a Facebook page. Oh, there, I've never seen it. But that's a different story. <laughs> um, but I have some wonderful people helping me get on it because I really enjoy it. Obviously, I like to talk. Yeah. So I'm told, Warren, just get on there and do a 30 minute, the 30 second video every day and do stuff. So we're, I'm building the, the uh, capabilities to do that. Yeah. So I hope to be more involved in social media. Just again, to share our message. Yeah. Awesome. Get it out there and give people some hope. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's absolutely unreal. Well, thank you once again. I, I think this is a very powerful podcast that hopefully a lot of people got a lot out of. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. Well, have a wonderful rest of your day. You're just starting for y'all. Yeah. Yeah, have a lovely <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> awesome. I will. Thanks, guys. Thank you. That was unreal, Talk to you later. Yes, yeah, we really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. My pleasure, buddy. Call me anytime or text me, email me. I sent you my uh, cell phone number too. If you ever oh, just cool. want to give me a call, I'm you're real. welcome to. All right, thank you very much. Thank we'll uh, we we'll definitely keep that. in touch, and I'll, I'll make sure I link everything that we've talked about today, um, all of your socials and everything. Oh, sorry, all of, like your email and everything like that, so people can re start reaching out. Um, and when we launch it, we'll send the links to you, and then you can send them on to your tech guy to, to do what he needs to do. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You got to figure it out, girl. That's exactly what I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's absolutely unreal, but um, I'm yeah. really excited to actually read the Tea Club, so I'm going to jump on and order that now. Oh, very good. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, and every e format too. Okay, uh, that's the best way to get it. Yeah, cool. All right, thank okay. you. Cool. That's thank unreal. You so All much, right, thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Right, bye bye now. Ya.